Welcome. Thank you, first of all, for taking the time to join today's discussion and webinar with regards to how every day can be made a repair day with a combination of intention, policies, and standards. Uh, the way we'll go through today's session and a rundown is that we'll start looking at why are we talking about repair in the first place? And then is repairability possible? Can it be done? How this could be integrated within the purchasing decisions and how this could be packaged uh, within an eco label? And then finally, how all the relevant stakeholders could come together so that this movement can go further and faster. Uh, and like with everything with regards to products, how to ensure that during the repair process and after safety of the consumer or the service engineer is, is maintained. So to help us uh, understand this a little bit more, uh, we have a recorded message from uh, Congressman uh, Joe Morelli from US. We'll also hear a little bit about practical experience and, and the struggle and the current situation from Mr. Kyle, who is the CEO of iFixit and he's a ring leader of this global repair movement. Then we'll hear from uh, Mr. Nick Liu from TCO Development on how this eco-label uh, is already updating the standard and criteria to incorporate requirements about repairability. Finally, from Mo Chatterjee from the World Economic Forum uh, to see how they are bringing together stakeholders uh, to take this movement further. And then some recommendations on how existing standards and requirements could be updated to address this. So first of all, also to everybody who has registered for uh, this uh, event, for this webinar, uh, from the various countries, uh, both in US, but also from Asia. So namaste, welcome, uh, uh, ohayo gozaimasu. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Um, and also for all of you representing different interests from your role within the overall supply chain, from assurance activities, manufacturing, brands, uh, governments, and so on. So it's interesting to see that while we have a lot of participants who are dealing in electronics, we also have some who represent interest from uh, textiles yeah, or, or semiconductor components, let's say. Uh, so let's start off listening to this um, short message from uh, the Congressman uh, Joe Morelli about what's going on in, in US and what the plans are there. Uh, Ryan, can we hear uh, the message, please? Hi, I'm Congressman Joe Morelli. I'm grateful for the chance to talk about my bill, the Fair Repair Act. This problem first came to my attention when I was a member of the New York State Assembly. And when I came to Congress, I saw the opportunity to make the right to repair a national and now global issue. For too long, large corporations have hindered the progress of small business owners and everyday Americans by, by preventing them from the right to repair their own equipment. Currently, repairs of digital items are intentionally limited by the manufacturer, and they require consumers to pay for repair services through their repair division or manufacturer authorized repair providers. These practices by manufacturers essentially create a monopoly on those repair services resulting in inflated high repair prices and high overturn of electronic items. I introduced the Fair Repair Act because I wanted to put the power back in the hands of consumers. I also believe strongly in the concept of a circular economy. Repairing and reusing products is an important piece in addressing our global environmental challenges. As we face down the climate crisis we have created, taking steps to reduce waste and remove ourselves from a linear economy can lessen the impact our missteps will have on future generations. Also, this pandemic clearly illustrated that consumers and small businesses need to be self-reliant and have the ability to repair their own equipment when large retailers have to shutter. The Fair Repair Act would require manufacturers of digital products from tablets to tractors to provide access to parts and service materials for consumers and independent repair people. This helps make technological repairs more accessible and affordable, finally giving not only individuals, but also small businesses the autonomy they deserve. Ultimately, this will mean higher quality device repair for lower prices and less environmental waste. Earlier this year, the FTC released a landmark report detailing the extent to which these restrictions hurt consumers. 
They also determined that there was scant evidence to support any claims that current repair restrictions are justified in the interest of maintaining device integrity and preventing reputational harm. Once passed, the Fair Repair Act will allow the Federal Trade Commission to penalize those who violate its provisions through civil penalties, including payment of damages, reformation of contracts, and refund of money or property. It also empowers the FTC to promulgate any rules or regulations necessary to carry out these enforcement duties and authorizes state attorneys general to enforce the provisions. I'm happy to see this issue has garnered international interest and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to address you today. I look forward to working with all of you. Together, we can make a huge difference in our country and in our world. God bless you. All right. So having heard from what's going on uh, in the US, um, uh, of course, we heard about the entire suite of products, but today we are essentially talking about electronics. So let's start looking at what are the electronics that you all are using in your everyday life? Uh, so if you all could please take a few moments to respond to this poll that has popped up on your screens. Ryan, can we have the first poll? Uh, what are the electronic products and ICT products that you are using, or that you own for work or for personal purpose, personal use, like mobile phones, laptops, tablets, or, or maybe if we miss something, something new that has popped up? So if you could select all the products that you are using, it gives us an idea of what we are looking at. And Ryan, I think we've, uh, we've received some feedback. So let's have a look at what the participants are saying. Okay. Okay. Thanks to all who have provided feedback. Yeah, you're right. Uh, electronics, uh, they're everywhere. Each one of us uses them. And we are in this day and age where everything that can be electrified is being electrified, is being automated uh, in our homes, in our offices, uh, in the factories, um, and so on. Yeah. So all of that, uh, of course, provides benefits in terms of uh, efficiency, but uh, we also have to be mindful of the impact uh, this has. Yeah. So when we talk of electronic products, uh, this is what the supply chain looks like. This is what the impact looks like. Yeah. It starts from raw materials, goes all the way through smelters, design process, production, distribution, usage by us, and then uh, repair by us, hopefully. Finally, going into end of life, which goes into circular economy or otherwise. Uh, today, we will look at it from the perspective of e-waste, uh, from the use phase, and also from the design phase. That will be the focus for today. Yeah? Um, and why? Because uh, consumers seem to want it. Consumers want that their phones should last longer. They want that manufacturers should provide uh, information about repair and it should be easier to repair. This is an example from, from Europe, let's say. So what did EU do as part of this landmark Green Deal? Uh, they, of course, have a component on circular economy action plan, which is then linked to the sustainable product policy framework, which has requirements including focus on designing sustainable products and electronics and ICT is one of the key product categories being looked at yeah, in terms of policy standards, regulations. So what's coming up also is this circular electronics initiative. Before end of year, this was the initial plan. At the moment, it looks like it will be sometime uh, in the mid of next year, where again, there's going to be a focus and emphasis on how repair can be promoted, how repair can be made easier than it is today for electronics. Some countries, for example, France already went ahead and developed a repairability index, which looks at several criteria. And then based on these, many products have already been rated, which is publicly available on a website. Uh, one of the panelists today, iFixit, uh, they have also been involved in uh, development of, of this criteria together with the government there. So now looking at that big picture, we talk about repairability. Uh, we ask you in terms of what you feel will be the impact if electronics could be repaired. And we see that 38% of you responded that it will help reduce waste. It will help reducing carbon emissions because after repairing your product will last longer. So with increasing the lifetime of the product, of course the emissions overall goes down. But some of you also said that there are some risks yeah, from 
the repair process, it could damage the functionality. Uh, there could be risk to the consumer who's uh, repairing it. Uh, it could also increase the cost of uh, ownership, let's say, in some cases. And uh, it could uh, reduce uh, the business for the companies who are manufacturing the products, because now we as consumers, or all of us, end up using products for longer. So it takes longer time before new products can come back. And it could also impact, let's say, the uh, waste handling sector. So thank you for all that feedback. We also ask you if you personally have some experience repairing products based on guides. Uh, many of you mentioned not applicable. Uh, a quarter of you mentioned you have not. Uh, so we'll hear from uh, Kyle what he has observed as the reason why consumers have not been able to repair, let's say. Uh, and we also ask you, what's the product that you last repaired? So 44% of you mentioned that it's clothing. Uh, either we have to stitch a button or uh, fix a tear or so on. But we also see many of you have uh, had a chance to repair small household appliances, uh, furniture, and so on. So thanks for that feedback. Um, and then in terms of repair costs, we see that a lot of you feel that there, this is part of your consideration during the purchase process. Uh, and some of you also provided feedback in terms of how much you have spent on repair. Having looked at that, um, Kyle, uh, please uh, enlighten us. Uh, we all know you as uh, the ringleader of the global repair movement. Um, you started with your organization and initiative a long time back. If you could please share what you are observing today, uh, both in the US, but also outside, and uh, your recommendations yeah, for the manufacturers, for governments, for standards makers. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Rakesh. That was a fantastic introduction. I like the interactive. This makes it more relevant to all of you when you get to see how we all fit in relative to each other. I think it's it's cool to see how many people are fixing clothes. Um, as a as a card carrying male, I feel like somehow guys have like forgotten how to sew. And I mean, this was traditionally uh, a uh, you know, something that all of us were participating in. It's really interesting clothes. Like if you think about like a men's dress shirt is I think the most mainstream product that comes with spare parts built into the product. If you look on, on the right, but uh, lower of, of the, the shirt, there's always an extra button or two. <laughs> and this is fantastic. And you think how many shirts have you had with that button that you never use? So repair could be a commonplace part of our lives. Uh, it isn't um, uh, particularly at the moment. And so we're, we're working to bring that back. Uh, I think that there really is an opportunity to make um, to, to make this uh, repair a substantial part of kind of how we look at the world and how we we expand our horizons and we and we imagine what the future of humanity looks like. It's not just a manufacturing society. We are maintainers. We are we are builders and we are maintainers. So at I fix it. Our goal is to enable everybody to fix all of their stuff. Um, we are a uh, small company with two locations in California and Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, and our goal is to teach everybody how to fix all of their stuff. Uh, if we could make repair cool and awesome, uh, maybe more people would want to do it. Uh, I want to be a badass like this dude. Um, and we're a community of, teaching, uh, of people teaching each other how to fix things. So I may know how to fix, uh, say, a cell phone, and you know, may know how to fix um, a sleeping bag, and we share that information, and together we are more uh, capable than any one of us is alone. Um, we've, we've, what we figured out is that you know, the knowledge of how to repair things is out there in the world. It's just not evenly distributed, and so we transition pockets of repair knowledge to places where it's needed. Uh, and we do that on iFixit. We have thousands of step-by-step uh, -step repair guides, troubleshooting uh, information. We're uh, up over 35,000 uh, uh, different products that we cover now um, and more more step-by-step -step repair guides being added every day. Um, we started doing this for Apple products. Our origin was Apple products. It was because Apple was going out of their way to prevent people from having access to this information. Now we're completely comprehensive with Apple products. Uh, I like to say Apple was like the first major company with open source service manuals online for every product that they sold, but it's because we did it for them or to them, depending on if you're in, in charge of marketing at Apple. Uh, and, and I fix it is global and uh, we're, you know, super, um, appreciative of our communities all around the world, but particularly like in Japan, our Japanese community is amazing. Our Korean community is amazing. Um, yeah, things are growing in, in, in China. So um, 
uh, all of our guides are, are, are localized and our translators, are, uh, you know, community translators are working really hard. Um, I fix it funds our work by selling parts and tools. So if you need a new uh, screen or battery for your phone, we'll sell you a repair kit with a part that um, will enable you to fix things. And uh, me personally, I'm on the engineering side. So I help keep our website up and running. Uh, and at any given moment, there's over a thousand people on I fix it doing repairs. Uh, and, and if we ever have a problem, a glitch, our servers go down, uh, we get calls from people saying, help, my laptop is in pieces. How do I put it back together? <laughs> uh, so this really, we think of I fix it as kind of fundamental infrastructure for humanity, where all of us should know how to fix all of our things. Uh, and access to that knowledge is really important. You can imagine if Wikipedia was down, that's a problem for the world. And, uh, and our goal is to make I fix it just as invaluable for everybody. Um, our, our systematic approaches provide guides, tools, and parts. And when we talk about the right to repair, we're really talking about access to these three things. You have the knowledge of how to fix things, you have the tools to get in and do it, and you have the parts that you need to do the work. Um, so here's an example of one of our guides. Samsung, um, I, I think has done a really great job with their wireless earbuds. You know, any product that has a battery, uh, th these batteries wear out. Um, they're consumable. It's just like the tires in an automobile. Uh, they wear out and we should be able to fix them. And so in the case of, of, of this product, Samsung designed the Galaxy Buds to where um, the, the batteries are relatively straightforward. Uh, I think I think it says 20 to 45 minutes. I think 20 minutes is, is plenty. Um, you just take a guitar pick, pop it in there, and you can, you can open it up and swap the batteries. Um, other products, I'll show you another in a minute where this is not the case, but this is an example of a product that is designed for repair. It's modern, it's sleek, it meets our performance objectives. This product is very highly reviewed in the gadget press uh, and it stands alone. Most wireless earbuds are not repairable. They're just a single use disposable product. And when the battery wears out after 18 months of use with these new earbuds, um, you just throw them away and buy a new one where with the Samsung earbuds, uh, it is possible to replace them. So that's cool. So we'd give this a reasonable repair score. I mentioned everything on iFix is open source. We think it's really important that all this information is available to the public, not just professional repairs, not just authorized repairs. They need to be available to everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, the other way that we iFix it funds our mission is we, we design and sell repair tools. And we're proud of our screwdrivers. Um, here's an example of our community troubleshooting. So you look at this and you say, okay, this is just a microphone issue on a phone. Well, look at the bottom. This has been accessed 53,000 times. So this particular, uh, I had this phone, this particular problem is very common. Uh, and so we can give feedback to manufacturers and say, hey, Google, maybe your original pixel, you had some problems with the, the microphone. Maybe there's an opportunity to improve the durability on that product. Um, I fix it has a uh, repair manifesto. We think that if you can't fix it, you don't really own it. And we've plastered these uh, these manifestos all over. If you want it, if you want one in your language, ifixit.com slash manifesto. We've got them in Korean and Chinese and Japanese and all kinds of other languages. Um, and and the global repair community movement is 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 significant. We have folks uh, on the call from all over the world. Uh, this is at a either a repair cafe or a fix it clinic where folks are coming together and learning how to fix things together. Um, the community aspect of repairing, I think, is really fun where products are manufactured in often factories far away from us. We don't see, we don't, we don't really have that connection with product for when you fix them, you open them up. And I think that there's an opportunity of opening something up and becoming more connected to the physical thing and also becoming more connected to the people around you and treating repair as a community act. Uh, of, of togetherness uh, is, is really compelling and cool. Um, so, you know, high level, I mean, I think, I think uh, we, we will talk more, but uh, uh, the rest of this, this event, but I mean, I, if, if everyone in the U.S. was to hang on to our phones just a little bit longer, if we were to use them for another year, it's the equivalent of taking 600,000 vehicles off the road. There's a huge long-term uh, carbon impact. There's a huge mining impact in manufacturing these new products. Um, so I will I will pass it off to some of the other folks here, but the repair is going to have to become a cornerstone of our economic and environmental future, or we're going to be, I think, uh, in a world of hurt. If we, we cannot, we're not going to be able to meet our climate objectives if we're not able to make the things that we manufacture, that we put all this time and blood and sweat and tears and resources into manufacturing the things that we have. 
we're not going to succeed as a civilization unless we can find a way to make those things last longer than 18 months in the case of you know, uh, earbuds. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm excited for the discussion. I'm excited for these other standards. We have to have a way, consumers have to have a way to choose environmentally preferable products. They have to have a way to choose more repairable products. And so uh, standards and the work that our other panelists are gonna present is, is an essential component to the broader repair ecosystem. We need consumers to be fixing more things. It needs to be possible for them. And, and, and consumers need the ability and information to buy more repairable products. Right. And, and Kyle, uh, will you be able to elaborate a little bit on how your discussions were, took place with the government in France with regards to repairability? What were the struggles and what your recommendations are? Some of the registered participants are representing governments in Asia. Uh, maybe they can uh, learn a few things. From yes, absolutely. That's a great question. Yeah, so this is the French Repair Index. Um, so we the, just a brief history of, of repair scoring. iFixit has been disassembling products and scoring them with our own internal uh, tooling uh, for a long time. And we rate products from one to 10, where one is almost impossible to repair. 10 is very easy to repair. Um, and the French uh, government and, and the European government too have been discussing and wanting to do something like this for, for a while. And so we shared our approach in our system and we shared some of the limitations. I fix its repair scoring system. It purely looks at like, how difficult is it to take it apart? Uh, if it's really easy to take apart, it gets a 10. If it's all glued together, it gets a one. Uh, the French government wanted to include other factors in their system. They said, well, well, it's not good enough just to look at the, the disassemblability. What about access to uh, parts? What about pricing of parts? And, and so they wanted to take a more holistic approach. And so we helped them expand the mechanical uh, system. That's about half of the French score is the mechanical component, but it also factors in the pricing of parts. And one thing that's cool about a government coming in and involving themselves in this way is I fix it doesn't include parts pricing in our repair score because we don't have access to that pricing. We don't know if you know, we, we just scored the Apple Watch today and we released uh, our teardown of the new Apple Watch. But I have no idea how much is a screen going to cost for that. Apple doesn't tell me. So I can't factor that into my pricing where the French government and, you know, tells the manufacturer, hey, you know, tell us how much the parts are going to be. And that that is a factor in, in your um, score. There, uh, there's another major factor that goes into these scores and a reason that all of these Samsung uh, phones are scoring eights and the uh, Fairphone is scoring an eight um, is that, that all of these phones have service manuals that are publicly available. And that availability of information is really key. And I would say that was one of the main points that, that I, I fix it made very clear to the French government that was really important to us was making sure that the public had access to this information. Uh, and and it's, it's an important factor in that score. Um, if you want more information on this, you can Google this, or I can, I can maybe share, I'll share the link in the chat. But the French government has posted a lot of their analysis, a lot of the research that went into it. They, they tried a bunch of different logos and settled on the logo. They've done behavior analysis on that. And they also have posted all of the spreadsheets and formulas that they use to calculate this. So I've had uh, US state governments ask us, hey, could we develop a new system in, in the US for something like this? And I said, what you should do is steal the French system, steal, copy it. <laughs> you know, uh, the uh, good artists, uh, good artists create, great artists steal, right? Uh, this is the great thing about governments and laws is it's all public. And I think that the French government would probably be honored if other governments around the world uh, took what they had and built upon it. Thanks a lot for, for sharing that interesting experience, yeah. And, and also your recommendation on what other governments should do, the ones that are planning, great. The French system Thanks. is really well done. I would say let, let's build on, on their success. Uh, and yeah. I don't think I have a slide for it, but the, the consumer reaction to this has been very positive. It's been very successful. Right, and, and Kyle, before you end, so let's say a product gets one of these repairability scores um, and the consumer looks at the score during their purchasing decision. Maybe it will be a year or a two before they actually have an opportunity to repair. Is there some kind of a feedback loop then also? Just like with iFixit that the consumer be able to say, oh yeah, yeah, I agree with this scoring. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think we don't have anything like that built in, but I would say where it comes in is you have to look at the used value of products. So mm -hmm. if you have a product, I'll, I'll give you an example. I have a Honda Civic. It's a great car. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason that Honda Civics are good cars and people like them is that they hold their value. They hold their resale value uh, uh, much better than other vehicles. They, they, they're durable. They last a long time. They're also easy to repair and there's parts available for them. And so mm -hmm. that, that long-term product holding on to its value, I think, is, is the best reflection. If you're looking for a metric, how do we know if repairability was successful? Look at the product three years, five years in and see how well it holds its value in the marketplace. Um, okay. People ask me a lot, they're like, you know, hey, I, I need a new phone. You know, I, I ab absolutely have to upgrade. You know, okay, cool. It's, it's perfectly fine to buy new electronics. Um, but the imperative is your old phone, what you should do, the best thing for the environment that you can possibly do is sell it and get as much money as you possibly can for it. Because however much money someone pays you for it is how motivated they are to use it and hang on to it down the road. All right. So hopefully someday somebody is going to mine all the information from eBay and Craigslist and Carousel on the products. Look at the price, look at uh, how old the phone is, and then we'll be able to compare it. Yeah. Okay. For the academics here, that sounds like a great project. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot uh, for sharing that, Kyle, and for sharing your experience. Now, having looked at that, yeah, we, we of course looked at uh, a score, a label for a product. And like many of us know, today when we look at a product, we look at the marketing material of this product, whether it's package or online. There's a lot of information about how great or cool the product is. There's also information about how green a product is, how sustainably made this product is. Uh, some of the eco labels for ICT products uh, are in here. And uh, thank you for everybody who provided feedback about your awareness and usage of these uh, uh, labels. So for example, we see, of course, TCO, uh, Blue Angel from Germany, the Nordic Swan, EPEAT. Uh, let's get an idea on how eco labels are incorporating repairability criteria and repairability assessment uh, within their awarding mechanism. Yeah? Uh, so Nick, can, can you please share with all of us what's going on within the, the TCO uh, eco label? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Uh, can you see it now? Yes. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Nick Liu. I'm with uh, TCO Development. I'm the Purchase Engagement Manager here in Asia. So uh, the, the repairability that certainly is uh, one of the big topics that we want to incorporate and uh, it's part of our product life extension um, criteria and as you see here this uh, green eye-shaped logo is, is what the TCO certified logo is you may find it in the back of your products or if you have an older model of something like CRT displayed it's in the front of your, your product uh, with a sticker so uh, before I jump into repairability let me give you some um, basic information about TCO certified. So um, TCO certified is a global sustainability certification uh, uh, for IT products. It's been used by uh, purchasers worldwide uh, in the public tenders when it comes to IT procurement. Um, we now, the criteria cover 11 product categories. There are the products that you, you, you will use in the office at home, and we include data center in the, in the in the line and also it's a, it's a quite comprehensive uh, criteria covers um, environmental factors and also sustainability uh, social responsibility in the supply chain throughout the life cycle of the product and uh, we try to update the criteria every three years and we happen to have the generation nine the latest one uh, launched in june this year so um, uh, it's uh, keeping up to to address the most pressing IT sustainability problems. And all of the, the products that we certified will be um, independently verified. The product will be tested. And, and uh, the, the, the major thing is to, to make uh, industry accountable for the changes. Um, so 100% of product models are tested before certification. And uh, we, we spend quite a amount of time uh, on product testing, factory inspections, 
and also get information from the supply chain. So it's about 20,000 hours per year. Um, so let's jump into uh, repairability. Why is repairability important? So we, we start first talked about the problems and the problems are the e-waste growth and also the climate change that we're facing now that is pretty critical. And the single most thing that the user uh, can do is to use the product longer. And to use the product longer, uh, repairability is playing a, a very important role as if the, the product is easy to repair, then uh, you don't have the hustle to sync. Otherwise, you just go repair the product. So uh, I think uh, what I think is, is, is doing is very good. I think it also helped us with the, the repairability criteria. As you can see on the left of the chart, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions by a life cycle of a notebook um, actually, 80% uh, of them are from the manufacturing phase. So no matter how much, how, how efficient the product is in the use phase, it accounts for less than 15%. So if you are buying a new product, then you will go through, again, the cycle of 80% uh, of the, the emissions from the manufacturing. So repairability is key, but the, how, how to make it easier. And there are some factors that you can look into the availability of the repair services, uh, how many how many locations that you can have the repair service, and also the critical components of availability. If you have to wait for a long time, would you do the repair? And uh, other spare parts, and also I think maybe most importantly the, the cost. But the cost, I. I like to make you think that the, the cost of ownership is also a cost, not just the, the cost of the, the parts. And uh, we at TCO uh, development on, uh, on the criteria of TCO certified, we focus more on the product design, starting from the mining sourcing and product design really is, is, is the magic to make even the, the loop smaller. So if you have a product which is quite circular in, in the design phase, it's, it's easy to repair, to upgrade, then uh, you will hold the product for longer. If the product has been designed not in so um, circular fashion, and there is a great hustle for you to repair the product or even replace a part, the battery, uh, then you probably will skip the, the service part you will go directly to refurbishing. And in Asia, we talk a lot about recycling, but recycling is not even so economical to, to think of. So um, uh, what about the criteria that we have for, for the lifetime extension in TCO certified? Uh, uh, we, we list uh, critical replaceable components for uh, each of the product category. You will see that uh, in the next slide and we use uh, standard standardized connectors. So the products which sent for application needs to use USB Type C connector. Um, that's for computers and phones, and everything. And product durability, we, we try to make the product as durable as they can. So there will be drop test. It's not so easy to pass. And battery longevity is another uh, very important topic. As battery is is associated with the product performance. So uh, minimum 300 charge cycles is, is what we tested. So uh, you still need, you need to have at least 80% of the uh, capacity to, to pass uh, our latest generation. Uh, secure data removal is also key for, for users. I have uh, several electronics still laying in my desk drawers. Uh, the, the main reason is that I, I'm not, having a secure data removal software to do so. So people are reluctant to return their products to, to the dealers or professional recycler. It's because one of the reason is, is uh, the aware of um, personal data being uh, breached. So that, that's one key that uh, we also provided uh, in the criteria. Um, so this is the list of uh, critical replaceable components is, is uh, for you to read afterwards, but we also include, as I said, the uh, data center. These three are new for generation nine, uh, the servers, storage products, and network equipment. And uh, 
there is some, something new that we're, we're trying. So we were having this uh, TCO certified benchmarking system. Uh, this is not the factor deciding if the product pass or fail TCO certified. Even if you, you don't provide this information, you will still be able to pass the, the certification. But uh, we add availability by target groups here. So if you don't provide any information for us, then, then you get the, the lowest classification by default. So, and, and we look into availability of uh, target groups. Is the part available for, for public? Is the, the manual spare parts available to independent repair services? You, you get different ratings. And then also the availability of the spare parts is it six or more years or four or more years? So what, we, what we're trying to do is, is kind of the inspiration of the, the French Repairability Index. But uh, once we collect the information, we will look into it and review and audit. That's uh, what we do uh, at TCO Certified as always. But this is for generation nine. So once these uh, sustainability for performance indicators are in place, these are not just, these are just part of them. Uh, and, and we created this benchmarking system. It will be, it will be very clear and transparent for the purchaser to see uh, which products are having more sustainable front than others, even though they all passed TCO certified criteria in, in, in the by essential. So um, when it comes to um, the changes in industry, that uh, the one single most important factor that the brand comes to us and asks to apply for, for product certification is because uh, in the tenders uh, for environmental compliance or sustainability factors in the tenders, they ask for TCO certified. That's the number one reason that we got contacted by brands. So we think that the procurement really has the, the power and the voice to change the industry accordingly. And uh, we're looking into two different kinds of buyers. So you have institutional buyers from government, from uh, corporate, and you have consumers, which uh, have um, maybe different weighing on, on the factors of uh, moving them to, to buy a product. So um, at TCO Development, we always focus on the institutional buyers. I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, first is because they, they always buy in bulk. So you may have a purchaser who are representing a, a company and buying for 100 people. And then they always have some budgets, whereas uh, consumers may, th their budget may vary. I personally may set the budget to, to buy a bicycle, but I end up paying much more. That, that's the case that happened to me, really. And also uh, the policy support, which usually don't come very early. But if the policy and the government regulations is supporting to have uh, more eco labels to be included in the tender, then uh, that's the power that they can go to tell the dealers. So that's why we think that the institution, inst institutional buyers usually has more uh, power than consumers. It's not, we're not saying that consumers' opinion is not important. It's just it's, uh, it's hard to get 100 unified consumer opinions at one time to tell the dealers that hey we want this bargain so uh, that's just uh, that's just different so uh, right to repair uh, the procurement's role is we think shift the focus from away from the consumers and recycling uh, we need to think of repair we use um, and volume purchasers can influence the product design as we as i mentioned that the number one reason the brand comes to us even though they know that TCO certified criteria is not so easy to pass, they, they still want it to change because uh, the tender requirements, the demand is there. And we, we as consumer or users or, or purchasers need to plan for longer use. Uh, what we are seeing now with the warranty in the tender is usually three years, um, not much mentioning service agreements. So I think this can be, can be changed if the warranty period come up to five years and a service agreement come out to another three years for repairing. That's, is, that's, that's good for the purchasing and that's good for the, the whole ecosystem. Maybe not so much to the industry. Um, the right to repair allows for longer use and secondary market development. And as Kyle just mentioned that uh, if we can retain the value of uh, repaired products, 
uh, with higher uh, money that you, you pay for that, you know, people or in nature will, will retain the product as long as possible. So they, they won't think that this is so cheap. I don't I don't really need, um, need to repair it. I can be better off by just buying new. And uh, I think this was also well covered by Rakesh's introduction. There are some uh, movements in the in the government front. Uh, the European Union has this eco design directive, even though it's not touching upon the eleven category categories that TCO certified is about. But there are some movements on the circular electronic initiative. There are about computers, smartphones, tablets, and printers, and. Um, yeah, we were happy to see there's new movements, even though uh, as I'm based in Asia, uh, there's nothing really uh, significant to mention about repairability, but we're hoping that uh, by tackling the e-waste problems, it will come soon. And here's the global purchaser engagement team at, at TCO Development. So we're quite global. Um, with Claire leading the team, I'm, I'm based in Asia. We also have a few people uh, based in Europe, which is our, I will say, the major market and also where initiative come from. And here's the content information. Uh, yeah, that's uh, my part. Um, thank you, Nick. Um, Nick, while you are at it, um, you, of course, have a lot of uh, customers. You have a lot of products that are already certified by the previous uh, version. Um, um, could you share with us how has the discussion been with your stakeholders uh, when you introduce these additional criteria, uh, either from the perspective of increasing the lifetime or repairability? Um, did you get some feedback, feeling from uh, the brands whose products have been certified by you? Yeah, well, uh, it's actually handled by my colleagues in the certification team, but I have heard some from them. So we were expecting some some resistance uh, yeah. in, in, in the beginning that uh, there might be brands not willing to cooperate. But uh, surprisingly, that uh, with this uh, uh, sustainability performance indicators, they are willing to share. Um, we have not decided if this will be... Uh, out there publicly at the, any timeline, we don't we don't have the timeline yet, but it's sur surprisingly to see that, that there there are positive feedbacks already, and we, we know that by changing the criteria, it we always find resistance. But um, mm -hmm. we also talk to the stakeholders when we design the the criteria. We we're not just uh, thinking of which criteria to be put in the the book. Uh, closed doors. So we, we already talked to stakeholders about, about what's happening and what, we, what we're trying to do. Is it too much to, to ask? So we're trying to find the, the quite good balance that's challenging for the industry, but not impossible to, to reach so that uh, we still want the uh, quite reasonable impact. Mm -hmm. Without anyone uh, certifying the, the products, then there's no impact. Right, okay. Thank you, Nick. Uh, and just to emphasize the point you mentioned about um, government purchasers, because our institutional purchasers, they buy in bulk. Of course, for Europe also, they have uh, a good hold on the GDP contribution with their products and services that are purchased. I think in America is similar. And we see that governments also have targets with regards to sustainable public procurement practices, and they are reporting every few years, yeah, because they sign an agreement about the sustainable development goals. So uh, thank you for giving that insights, Nick. And, and I think the Asia Pacific Green Public Procurement, uh, some of their members who are with us today might also find this uh, relevant. But now looking at it, uh, we, of course, uh, what you explained, Nick, was uh, that it's okay. You were expecting resistance, but uh, it was well received. Uh, however, if this has to be a global movement, perhaps uh, more stakeholders need to be connected uh, and aligned to move it forward. During the registration process, uh, uh, you all provided feedback with regards to what you feel are the major roadblocks, roadblocks uh, to have mainstreaming of greener and fairer uh, ICT uh, products, electronic products. And we see that uh, one fifth of you indicated that perhaps there has to be more emphasis on a business case for this. 
or there have to be more incentives for companies to purchase uh, greener, better, more repairable, durable products. Yeah, But perhaps there's also a, a conception that uh, if the product is repairable, it will come at a higher price point. And maybe during Q&A, we can address this. So now looking at all of those aspects uh, where maybe a power uh, and push is required, bringing together all of these stakeholders, uh, let's hear from uh, Mr. Mo Chatterjee, who's at the, a fellow at the World Economic Forum, and he focuses on circular economy, and he's joining us today from Germany, where it is uh, quarter to five in the morning. So, Mo, uh, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us time out of your sleep, and thank you for joining us and uh, enlightening us on what's happening on a overall global level yeah, with your efforts. Cool. Um, thanks very much. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Cool. Sorry. Wonderful. I missed the rehearsal, so uh, I wasn't too sure if my audio was working well. Um, yeah. So um, <clears throat> yeah, more chatter here. Um, it is very early, so if I uh, if I do say anything silly or I'm not being understandable, please tell me because um, I don't want to be that guy in the panel who everyone's like, "What? What are they saying? Um, we, we we don't understand." And, and there's there's usually one. So um, just uh, maybe Rakesh, you can be the person I entrust with this. Um, okay. uh, Keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, yeah, so I am um, uh, based at the World Economic Forum at the moment. Um, I'm uh, so sitting in Germany, so in Berlin, but I am originally from Scotland, by India and Pakistan, so that's why I look and sound the way I do. So hopefully, no confusion uh, on any of your sites there. Um, and yeah, been focusing on electronics for the last little while. Um, let me just bring up the. Um, uh, slide deck that I prepared for this. So hopefully you can see that now. Um, yep. And basically there's four things I want to do today. Um, so one is really quick, why should we care about electronics? I think you've probably been through this, so I'm not going to spend much time. Um, example, smartphones. So um, just deep dive a little bit into um, yeah, smartphones, these things, um, which um, are kind of increasing in uh, I mean, more and more people have them, and of course, their environmental impact is becoming more and more apparent. Um, quick bit on public procurement. So understand a lot of you guys are in the public procurement space. So what can you guys actually do about it? Um, and at the end, just what is the uh, what is the WEF, which is the World Economic Forum, doing? There's a few things um, which they are doing on their side. So um, oh, just jump in the start. So um, electronics, I mean, there's two big things, I think, that we can talk about. One is the waste streams. Um, and one is the carbon emissions, right? So on the waste stream side, there's lots of e-waste. We know about this. Um, we know that um, lots of it is not collected for recycling. We know lots of it is not documented, that much of it ends up in household waste, that it ends up being um, incinerated sometimes, that the toxicity uh, sort of affiliated with it uh, is big. Um, and we also know it's growing very quickly. Um, so, um, we're on track for 120 million tons of e-waste annually by 2050. Um, and we also know um, uh, we've got a lot of a lot of old devices kicking around at home. So um, there's a lot of uh, guesses and estimates made about that because no one's exactly sure, of course. Um, but um, yeah, there's lots of, uh, if you think about yourselves, I'm sure you, I mean, I know I have um, uh, at least at least one or two smartphones kicking around that I don't really know uh, what I should be doing with, and, and I'm supposed to be speaking to you as an expert on this. So so it's definitely a, a problem um, uh, kind of across the board. On the carbon emissions side, um, you'll see the visual here. Um, basically, it's uh, about um, digital technologies, so very kind of broadly. Um, um, but the point I want to make here is we have two types of emissions, right? So you have the emissions that are embedded in products. So these are the emissions which are um, created during the build phase, so to uh, create the metal or to e extract the metal, um, to um, get the plastics in the in the shape that you need them to be. Um, all this is of course done in the build phase, and then you have the electricity or the power which is used in the um, in the use phase, um, and you know data centers, networks, uh, terminals, that kind of thing, um, and. Uh, of course, that's what you can theoretically with green energy. You can um, you can um, or with renewable energy. Sorry, you can you can make that um, carbon neutral in the use phase at least. But certainly in the uh, um, in the build phase, it's going to take a long time before we can get that into a sort of carbon carbon neutral territory. Um, yeah. So 
Um, what I wanted to do was just quickly focus in a little bit on um, on smartphones because I think, as I said, they're um, they're a really important um, product group. Um, why are they important? I guess, as I said, lots of people have them. So four in ten people globally own a smartphone. Um, and here I'm kind of differentiating between a smartphone and a mobile phone. So um, uh, smartphones typically have more um, components, more kind of rare metals. Um, uh, required than let's say the dumb phones that we used to have um and the average lifetime of a smartphone is around three years in the usa um obviously this is different in different places um but in some places it's even i think it's even shorter than this um and there's certainly vast kind of swathes of the population who who um from a mental perspective see the lifespan of a um, of a smartphone being around two years and um, because that's the typical contract length um, that you have at least in western europe um, and, and people like affiliate this contract length with with uh, with a, the suggested lifespan, which unfortunately is 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 not correct at all. Um, but 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 that's kind of what's happening. So, um, what's happening with smartphones? What are people like? What's uh, what's what's important with them? Um, two points I mentioned at the start: so GHG emissions and waste streams. Um, on the GHG emissions side, so. Um, 85 to 95 percent of smartphone um, emissions um, occur in the production phase, right? So um, the vast, like the vast majority, and that number changes depending on your phone. And you can argue maybe it's 75 percent. Some people might say it will be for some phones, but regardless of what that number is, um, extending the lifespan um, is key to reducing emissions because if you keep on replacing these things every two years. Um, you are you're continually kind of um, demanding that eighty five to ninety five percent um, of those um, um, uh, of those emissions, and I guess I mean the thing is as you use this longer, right? The that number eighty five percent goes down because your use phase emissions go up, and that's of course the thing. But I think the the main point to recognize here is like regardless of how um, like energy efficient your phones are. Um, um, extending their lifespan is, is the is the smart way to to reduce the um to reduce the um um uh, ghg emissions just on that there's a there's a good a good study that was done recently by the um Ukotec guys and it wasn't on smartphones it was on i think it was on notebooks and they were saying like how long it would take um to make the ecological payback um uh for a for a a notebook that was getting more um energy efficient and i said if a notebook became more energy efficient 10 percent every year um if you even by doing this if you replaced it um it would take 90 years for you to claw back um all the all the ghg emissions that were kind of um actually um put in in the um in the use phase so so really extending lifespan is um is really key there um on the waste stream side smartphones contribute around 10 percent of e-waste um and of course extending lifespan slows down this flow of waste um so keeping it longer you have fewer which are going into that into the waste streams every year um that's quite a uh, obvious point i think um on the human rights side we know um that conflict elements tin gold tungsten um are mined in areas where human rights abuses are commonplace unfortunately so child labor is happening um yeah people talk a lot about democratic republic of congo it's kind of one of the one of the key places where this is happening and of course, extending lifespan reduces the need for replacement elements here um, and um, raw material shortages. So um, we know, I mean, the, the kind of chip shortage that we've had uh, recently has shown us quite clearly, um, raw materials are not unlimited in supply. Um, and of course, these are going to become more and more precious over the coming years as, as raw materials um, yeah, as we use more and more of them and realize um, uh, kind of uh, become aware of how many we've got of them. I think the, uh, uh, the Royal uh, Society of Chemists say that within, um, I think within 30 years, there are already six elements in smartphones, which are, which are likely to be, um, uh, to go extinct, if you like, um, or we're going to run out of them. Um, and the other thing to mention is that a lot of the elements that you actually need or the raw materials that you need for uh, smartphones um, are also crucial elements of other components, um, which we really require <laughs> for the energy transition. Um, so things like um, silicon and indium uh, are used in solar cells, um, 
and um, we need a lot more solar panels. Um, so um, uh, slowing down the requirement um, um, for these guys uh, in, in smartphones um, is absolutely key. So that's a smartphone topic, and um, you know, if people are interested, we can talk about it in the um, in the Q and A. Um, but um, I think I'll I'll move on, just keep this moving uh, just briefly um, on to. Um, uh, uh, oh, I, f I forgot. I actually had two slides on smartphone. Apologies. I, I blame the early morning. Um, yeah. So basically, extending smartphone lifespan. So um, um this is uh, a, a small kind of just thought experiment, if you like. But if you if you if the average um a use phase for a mobile phone is three years, and you just use it for one year more. Now, I'm not saying consumers can always use it for one one year more. You know, there are also um, issues with uh, functionality, which you may um, have to deal with. Um, but in many cases, it's possible. I think um, this is like three and a half years old and it's still going um, actually fine and I use it a lot. Um, so I'm hoping to hit the four year mark. That's the, that's the plan. Um, and basically, if you do that over your lifetime, um, theoretically beforehand, if you use three, um, you know, you'd use 20 devices over 60 years, um, let's say, um, for someone like me who started with a smartphone when I was about 20, uh, assuming I lived to about 80, um, if all goes well, um, then, you know, you reduce your uh, number of devices from 20 to 15, um, which is a 25% reduction. Um, um, but in order to do this, uh, in order to increase this lifespan, uh, I think we can increase more. I'm not saying four years is the, is, is, is the, is the stopping point, just that um, I think it's more realistic to talk about four years right now than, than let's say, six. Um, um, firstly, there's like, you know, we need things from different people. There's lots of different stakeholders involved. One is the government, so pushing for ambitious right to repair. From manufacturers and retailers, of course, they need to embrace repairability, durability, and also new business models. So rental, leasing, keeping their phones, refurbishing them, moving them on. Um, repair services, um, so increasing convenience, uh, reducing price, but also increasing our kind of um, trust in them. Um, um, it's going to be ideal, uh, sorry, going to be going to be quite crucial. Um, and for consumers, it's understanding the need and availability of repair, and then acting on it. So even if I know about it, <laughs> um, I still need to I still need to do it. And I think one other point that that there is also on the um, uh, let's say the secondhand refurbished side. So more um, um, so a higher willingness to to purchase refurbed um, electronics. Um, um, but this will also, of course, require high quality uh, refurbishment too. Um, so yeah, that's the, that is, um, all I wanted to say on smartphones for now, let me move on real quick, uh, to public procurement. And I think we heard a little bit of this now from, from Nick. So I, I'm not going to go into this in too, um, too much detail, but I think there's, uh, there's two ways I was thinking about how you could, um, consider this. So, so on the internal level within your organization and obviously externally market facing, um, I think on the internal side, um, it's just a prioritization of extending the life of IT equipment instead of replacement. So um, having that as a starting point. So if you know that that's the case, then of course, repair kind of falls into it. Um, of course, you can then think about like, um, who are you shortlisting? Uh, you can go through, obviously, uh, we talked about TCO, um, uh, the different kind of um, standards which exist. Um, of course, that's one way of doing it. But I think what's also really important is understanding within your organization what's um, like what's what are the barriers to repair. So, um, of course, availability of IT is like extremely important. Like people don't want to be offline. Like, do you have enough um, uh, replacement machines while people are going? Is your IT actually set up that I can even use a replacement machine? Like, is everything on people's like private desktops? Probably not these days. But you know, um, these kind of questions are obviously important, and I think. Like having it, it'd be difficult to to put a strategy together without understanding what the what the barriers are already within your organization and, and trying to you know remove as many of them before you kind of go in that direction. Um, and then on the kind of external external market side, um, again, we just heard from Nick saying how much more power um, um, like the big buyers, the institutional buyers have than individuals, and of course this is the case. So um, really explaining to the market like. Um, and telling them like why this is uh, why this topic is important for you, like durability, um, uh, long life, um, repairability. Um, uh, I think, of course, um, retailers and, and, and manufacturers they hear this um, from from government, 
but if they're hearing it from customers, um, I think it makes things a lot a lot easier for them um, because um, they have a stronger like story internally to kind of go with. And I hear this all the time from like the manufacturers. They're always like, "Oh, you know, if we until like the 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 um, until our customers say they want something, we can't do anything." So you're a customer, so you, so you can you can talk about this. Um, exploring renting and leasing equipment, I think. Um, um, this is um, certainly an interesting idea, depending on um, on how you guys work. But if you have a long term agreement with a with a leaser, um, you basically just um, uh, you're you're paying for the service of um, of of IT rather than the uh, the the actual hardware or the laptops or the computer screens or whatever it is themselves. Um, and we assume here that devices go back to manufacturers and retailers, and that they can repair them, refurbish them. Um, and keep them in the loop. So um, it may not be that you have to necessarily increase the lifespan of every machine you work with, but it may just be an easy way of bringing in re um, repair because when you're done with the machine, it automatically goes back to these guys um, and um, um, and they kind of uh, keep it in the loop uh, to, to lease out to the next person or back to you. Um, developing a partnership with a repair service um, provider, a repair service provider, or even, as, as I mentioned, like a, like a refurbisher, it could just be that you um, strike up um, a deal with someone that who takes all of your old IT um, and um, refurbs and resells um, is another way of, of thinking about uh, of reducing your, your environmental footprint. And finally, the last one is, is um, um, a little bit um, yeah, specific to the smartphone topic, but there are now solutions to separate business and personal functionality of a smartphone. So I know a lot of people, myself included, don't like to have um, you know, they, they want to have two phones, one for their work and one for one for their personal life. Um, but there are ways now where you can put both of those functionalities onto the same phone and just uh, switch between them, um, rather like the kind of where you have those dual SIM card phones, um, which work between multiple regions. You also get this for um, um, for business and personal. And this could be a way of um, actually, um, or an offer that you can make to employees as well. Say, hey, this is how you can uh, save both um, um, both money, but also kind of smartphone usage. Because of course, if every kind of uh, if lots of people have two smartphones, one for one for work and one for one for play, then um, yeah, then we're um, increasing that uh, that flow a long way. So that's pretty much uh, uh, that's pretty much it. Sorry, I, I went a little bit slower than I should have done. Um, last one is just on what we're doing at the World Economic Forum. I think uh, we can discuss some questions if it's of interest. Um, we kind of. Um, uh, have, a, have a, um, a circular electronics partnership which drives a coordinated transition um, through six pathways. Um, they published a white paper on this in 2019. Um, and on a more personal level in Germany, we're running an awareness raising campaign regarding life extension of electronics. If any of that is of interest to you or you want the content, we should have multiple uh, languages available. Do let me know. Um, we should have some videos and I, I think we'll be, we'll be quite willing to, set, uh, to share. Um, they'll be aimed at consumers, but um, yeah, it could be interesting for you guys. Yeah. And that's it. Um, yeah, I, uh, I hand over uh, Rakesh. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mo. Uh, Mo, while you are at it, could you share with us uh, the kind of discussions that are taking place with regards to repairability within, let's say, the circular electronics partnership and so on, uh, and also with regards to the lifetime extension in Germany? Uh, how big a role is the topic of repairability playing in that? Yeah, so I think um, repairability is moving up the agenda pretty quickly. So, I mean, I, I don't know if you saw, but even, I mean, it's hit the, the US pretty big in the last couple of weeks. I mean, it was on Trevor Noah was talking about it on The Daily Show. Um, so, I mean, it's not often these topics get talked about in these kind of arenas. So I think it's it's certainly moving up there. Um, in Germany, like you have this um, kind of... Um, there's, there's always been a movement of repair here. There's like repair cafes are quite big here, particularly in Berlin where I live, Frankfurt, um, because you have this high level of like engineers here who um, like there's a lot of people who like you know tinkering with cars and stuff in Germany. It's like it's like a national pastime. So um, I think that's definitely um, the case um, on the uh, um, on the cir like circular electronics partnership. Um, yes, um, there is kind of um, um, talk about this. Uh, it's about kind of driving demand for the, for the services. Um, but I, I think actually, um, and this is the thing, um, uh, most of the, the guys who are in the, like, like repair is typically a very kind of, um, it's, 
not something that, that the big manufacturers and retailers typically do. It's usually like a mom and pop kind of job where you have like a random store that does it. And I think this has been the, the, the trouble. So it's, it's difficult to discuss with them a circle of electronics partnership because typically they have like the big players on board um, who don't actually necessarily know much about the sort of day in, day out of, of repair businesses. Um, and what we're seeing in Germany is more kind of um, marketplaces popping up to try and connect consumers to reputable repair places because they do tend to be individual actors. I mean, I think of course, I think we have iFixit on today, so it's like um, they're, they're kind of bigger, but uh, the market typically is, is very um, fragmented. Um, uh, so yeah, I hope that gives you a bit of flavor to your question. I'm not sure if I completely like, answered it, but that's the, that's the sort of um, landscape that we're dealing with, I think. Thanks for sharing uh, more. Now, we, we hear a lot about the repair process uh, itself, yeah? And, and one of the topics has been, before we get to the repair process, uh, of course, it makes sense, uh, going back to what uh, Kyle mentioned in the beginning, one way to look at how well it's working out, the repairability scores and so on, is to look at uh, the retained value of the product. So clearly, as we've been hearing from Mo and, and Kyle and Nick, that uh, extending the lifetime uh, has value, of course, from environmental perspective, but also has value from economic perspective. Yeah, and repair could be that one measure that can be implemented to retain that value for longer. Now, overall, if we were to look at the repair process, uh, the kind of mom and pop shops you mentioned, or like repair cafes, they would typically start off looking at a product, looking at uh, what the fault is, the problem is, disassemble, assemble it, go through a repair based on instructions, hopefully put it back together, check it once, uh, and then pass it back. And it, during this phase, there, of course, uh, are some risks. Uh, there are some risks, and uh, later on, we will also hear from uh, Kyle on how the iFixit clinic, for example, uh, the people working there address this risk. But also, there's a risk after the process. So, for example, after these components have been changed, put together, are there some risks and how they are being addressed? On a high level, these could be electrical risks, uh, thermal risks, mechanical risks, or chemical risks. Imagine somebody puts something not so properly and there's a possibility of a fire or a shock um, or, or something just breaks down because it was not put down together. Or maybe there's some contamination or hygiene issue if you are changing the water pump of a coffee machine and its uh, care is not taken to maintain the hygiene for that component. How could this or these risks be addressed? Uh, could there be a risk assessment framework? Uh, here's this example from um, the university in DEF. They, they looked at the overall risk assessment um, for the repair process and also after the product is repaired. And they put out this matrix that can be utilized possibly by manufacturers, brands. And they also evaluated a set of products, uh, a hoover or coffee maker, uh, a mixer grinder on what could be the potential risks, what could be the mitigation actions. Um, additionally, there are already product safety considerations into these uh, repairability scoring systems. So in the EN 4554 or the RSS system, which is coming from the EU Joint Research Center, uh, but also in the uh, iFixit uh, repairability scorecard, there are considerations on, on this aspect. Um, now, for those manufacturers who feel Evaluating for repairability and making it possible for consumer, it poses risks and that will increase the cost or complexity for us to place the product on the market. Well, if you look at the column of technical aspects, all manufacturers, brands are doing this. They are looking at consumer safety. They are looking at data protection in case of connected products. They are looking at disassembly requirements and so on. Sometimes it's purely linked to the risk assessment that they have to conduct, which is mandatory, let's say, for, for CE mark based on the ISO 12100, where in addition to the use phase of the product, the repair phase can also be considered and risk mitigation steps can be implemented. The same is for data security. There are standards already existing. So if somebody is uh, considering a risk that during the repair process, somebody is introducing spyware well, there's a standard to evaluate this. On the other hand, with regards to disassembly procedures and what tools to use, most manufacturers' products who are, which are on the European marketplace, they are doing this calculation of triple R for the WEEE requirement. And so they are indicating what tools are being used to put the components out and calculating them individually. 
And then with regards to repair instructions, again, there's a standard, the IEEE 1874, which can be utilized. It's an existing standard. Um, the other aspect, which is with regards to reviewing components for interoperability or how this can be part of the alternate component evaluation when the product is going through safety certifications. Yeah, uh, And then looking at if in reality, spare parts are being delivered in the time which is being promised. So on a high level, let's say in order to ensure safe product repair, design plays a strong role. Um, also, it's important to provide information in a high quality, in a manner which is usable and interoperable, and to ensure that the spare parts which are being available, which are available, let's say, in the local marketplace, are of a high quality. Now, having looked at that, uh, perhaps it's interesting to get your feeling. What do you feel is required next with regards to repairability? So if you could please uh, provide your feedback uh, to this poll. Uh, would you say that, hey, uh, okay, we hear about repairability, but no need to change anything. Let it be the way it is. Or would you say we should have an iFixit clinic in every country in Asia? Uh, would you say that eco labels like the one, uh, like TCO, should make minimum repairability score like a requirement? Um, uh, and would you say that to start off and to allay the fears of product safety, that all existing product safety standards, regulations, directives, they must include risk assessment requirement for the repair phase and post repair phase on the product. Uh, and would you say that those repairability scores, for example, should be independently verified based on different eco-label programs? Uh, and since we are in a globalized world, would you say that, well, it's also important that as these programs are developing, we heard from Kyle about a great artist stealing, that countries should harmonize these requirements across the board, yeah? So that it's uh, clear for the manufacturers, clear for the consumers, and uh, it's, it does not increase too much the cost of compliance. So it's interesting to receive your feedback, yeah? And let's um, ha have a look at it then, Ryan. Okay. Okay, great. Um, let's keep looking at this and, and uh, perhaps if um, we start with you, Kyle, when you look at uh, this feedback and let's say 50% of the respondents who have responded, they say there should be an iFixit clinic in every country in Asia. What, what do you think about it? You're setting me up to do a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I mean, we, we have to start with changing consumer perceptions and consumer attitude. By, I mean, even the word consumer is not a very good word, right? You get things, you know, sold to you and you use them and you use them up and then what? Like, we need to be more of a part of the system. So uh, that's what I like about DIY repair. I, I wouldn't be out there saying, you know, like we're going to be repairing the, the majority of repairs in the world. The majority of products will be repaired by consumers. Um, but by having individuals do the work, whether it's in a community cafe or doing things themselves, it starts to bring them into the system and they, they start to understand a little bit more of, of how much effort it was to make the thing in the first place. And I think that by having individuals be more aware and more in the loop and more involved, um, that I think that that helps on the path. It's going to take an all of the above solution, though. It's, this, it's mm -hmm. not going to be any one thing. But changing right. how individuals think about all of the things in their lives is going to be an essential component. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks, Kyle. Um, and, and then over to you, Nick. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned to us that uh, while you have tried out these additional criteria, there is no timeline yet. We see that uh, from the respondents, some of them also indicate that, ah, perhaps there should be a minimum repairability score. Uh, do you have an opinion? Do you have a feedback to that? Yeah, I think it's it's quite uh, interesting to see that uh, so a good portion of uh, people think that that is important, and I think this kind of voice should be uh, is necessary for us to make a change. Uh, if the voice is from TCO certify inside internally yeah. to the brand owners, it may not be so effective. Mm -hmm. But if it's from the purchasers, the consumer's point of view, then the voice is much bigger, much more powerful that, that we can mm -hmm. implement that in this uh, in the criteria. So I think yeah, it's, it's great to, to see this movement. Okay, all right, great. And, and then more. Uh, there's 
feedback on one topic with regards to global harmonization do you feel that in the club that you have in the world economic forum do you see a possibility where you bring together governments and businesses together and stress upon how it's important that when we start talking of repairability that there should be greater alignment and harmonization across the governments amongst the governments Um, and is that something that um, World Economic Forum could be looking at? Yeah, I, I think in, in an ideal world, yes. Um, so, like um, having similar standards, at least across like regions. I think maybe um, from a sort of practicality approach, it doesn't always make sense to have um, every, you know, the same in every every country out there. Um, I think in an ideal world, the Circular Electronics Partnership would be able to do that. But um, as we all know, kind of bringing people together to create a line standard is a, is a pretty tough process as we're about to see at COP26. Um, so um, short answer, we'd love to. Um, uh, how easy or practical that is, um, yeah, it's, it's it's tough to tell. I think there there is definitely a, a aim to do it, but um, exactly how far along uh, we are at the moment and how far we'll get is, uh, is kind of TBC. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mo. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, the first one, and I think, Kyle, you might be able to chime in on this one. It's about what do you think can be done in regards to availability of electrical components and how to exchange them for consumers? Do you think that consumers or these local shops will be the most common repairer for PCB or components on a PCB? Yeah. Well, I think increasingly we're seeing that the re repair shops are stepping up and have uh, particularly enhanced skills. This is an area, to be honest, where the U.S. and Europe are copying Asia in a big way. Like this is just common sense. This is everyday uh, practice on the streets of you know Shenzhen or Delhi, uh, and mm. and all of a sudden it's surprising to people in, in you know the U.S. or in Berlin. Oh, you can do board level repairs. Wow, this is new. It's <laughs> like we're inventing the world over again. Um, so two things. One, you have to start with the schematic. So you you always can fall back if you can't get a, a part uh, if you can't get an ic or if you can't get a component you can always harvest a component from a donor board so uh the key the first uh kind of building block is the schematic and this is part of all of the right to repair frameworks that we have supported is they have to provide access to board level schematics imagine that you have a uh, let's say it's a it's a you know surface mount resistor. In the good old days, a, a resistor would have color coding on it. It would be labeled with the 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 capacity right the value of the resistor. Now it's so small you can't fit a label on it, so you have to have a schematic because if you have a board where that resistor is blown, you can't measure it. <laughs> it's it's it's, mm -hmm. it's carbon, um, so you have to have the schematic. Going beyond that to the question that was asked here. Uh, what do we do about availability of parts? This is where I think that the exclusionary contracts are really a problem. There are mm -hmm. uh, many par parts. This is common with Apple. It's common with other manufacturers where they'll take an off-the-shelf part. They'll make some minor tweak to it. Um, and then they make the manufacturer sign a contract uh, with Apple saying, you cannot sell that part to anyone else. And that contract is an anti-competitive measure that completely eliminates aftermarket. We see this happening with MacBook charging chips, for example, that this is the case uh, across many products. So we have to look, I think this is a government level initiative to say exclusionary contracts, you, you, you shouldn't be able to you know, uh, have a contract where you say, you, you can only sell this to me and not to anyone else. That's a real problem. Mm, got it. Thank you for that. Uh, there's one more, and I think both Nick, you and Kyle can chime in. And the question is that um, in most cases, professional repairs are expensive. And while consumer repairs are cheaper, they bring in this extra safety risk. How will this be assessed? So maybe we start with Nick, you, Nick. Uh, there was a, you showed us one slide where you had mentioned some critical components from repairability perspective. Um, is there also a safety aspect which is being looked at there? Uh, that's uh, quite deep into the criteria document, which I don't have uh, good knowledge of. I've, I can bring this question back to my certification team. Uh, what happens to the big enterprises or, or the, some government uh, organization is that uh, they they have this IT department. 
mm-hmm. to, to handle some basic requirements for for their users. So uh, I think that that's the way they they wanted to do. Um, Got it. Yeah. Okay. And, and Kyle, from your experience at iFixit Clinic. Um, do you all also have a thorough mechanism on uh, before your staff starts fixing stuff, uh, how they take care of safety, both for them and also post repair? Yeah, I mean, we pay attention. Yeah, the safety issue is primarily around uh, batteries and, mm-hmm. and components that, that plug in the wall with large capacitors. Outside of that, repairing most products is pretty darn safe. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I think that the safety risk, I mean, we, we help just to put this in context, we have 9 million people a month repairing things using iFixit uh, and we don't have safety issues. We don't hear about safety issues hardly ever. Um, okay. So we're talking about single digits out of millions. Uh, th- mm. th- this is, I understand that we're in government and compliance and insurance and we want everything to, to be flawless uh, but there is an element of personal risk that we have to assume. I was mm-hmm. I was stripping a wire over the, the weekend and I and I cut my thumb. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's fine, right? <laughs> I put a bandaid on it and we move on with our lives. It's okay. Uh, you know, I, it was a Swiss Army knife. Um, yeah. Should Victorinox be responsible for my behavior? Right? I screwed up and cut my thumb. It's okay. Uh, yeah. Every car, if you own a car, it comes with a, uh, a wrench and a jack for lifting up the car and changing the tire. Can you hurt yourself changing a tire on a car? Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Is it far more likely I'm going to hurt myself changing a tire than changing a battery on a car? Yes. Um, but that's an accepted part of, of the world that we live in. And so I think we have to balance our concerns about safety uh, uh, risks with uh, you know, it's saying, hey, you know, like we also have a risk that uh, of what happens when we hit two degrees climate change. It's mm-hmm. it's going to be a lot more harmful to us than than some people, um, uh, you know, some very small fraction of people may be hurting themselves during a repair. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Um, and, and before we end uh, more, let's say in two years from now, it's 2023 autumn. Uh, you are here to share with everybody again what's going on yeah, and what happened in the past two years. What do you hope to be sharing with everybody with regards to repairability and extension of product lifetime? What do you hope to have uh, achieved in Germany yeah. or elsewhere? I, I hope the manufacturers have really got on board. Um, and I mean, Kyle just mentioned some of the anti-competitive stuff that's happening, but really um, that they... <clears throat> either sign up to or are forced to sign up to um, some more kind of um, stringent measures on, um, on, the, on the durability side. Um, I think um, it's, uh, yeah, it, I, I think anti-competitive is the right word um, for this. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, go on, I'll, I'll use it anyway. Um, uh, so I think that's the key one. Um, and of course, like, um, you know, bit, as this happens, you'll see more and more repair stuff popping up um, because it's now more possible. Um, and I think like that just the, uh, the topic is gaining a bit of momentum with consumers, but again, yeah, I think like, just to, to voice Carl's point, like this is this is everyday practice uh, in mm-hmm. uh, a whole lot of countries all over the world. Like it's time that we uh, um, we go back to it. Um, so yeah, that's the key one: um, getting the um, getting the manufacturers on board. Um, and once we have that, I'm hopeful the rest will kind of fall into place. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and Nick, in two years from now, will we have the new revision of uh, TCO standard with repairability criteria in there? No, you have to wait for three years. But uh, the the new newer generation discussion is ongoing already. Uh, after we we developed the generation nine, so so yeah. But got but it. our duration is three years. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got it. Uh, and Kyle, uh, what do you hope to be telling us? You started off showing us that you have one office in US, one in Germany. You told us about how your involvement in uh, the French repairability scores and the discussion with states. What do you think you will be telling us in two years from now? You know, it's moving so fast. It's really so hard to know. Uh, Chile has stated that they're interested in copying the French index. Uh, So I certainly would love to see this uh, spreading across Asia. We've seen the Australian government exhibit a lot of interest in these topics. 
Um, so I'm really hopeful that we can, at a minimum, get a baseline. Once one jurisdiction, whether it's Norway or Massachusetts or so, once one jurisdiction passes right to repair law and says, in order to sell products here, you have to make schematics and service manuals available, that will open things up for the world. And I think that will set a new floor. And then we'll say, where can we build on top of it? And how do we ratchet this up from there? Good. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Kyle. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, Mo, for waking up this early. And thank you for everybody who stayed uh, and your interest on this topic. A recording of uh, this session will be shared with all. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I wish you all a happy repair day every day then. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.